Welcome to the earnings preview for the second quarter of 2023, continuing our coverage of earnings season. I'm joined by my wonderful co-host, Aisha. Aisha, how's it going? Great. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Earnings season is always super exciting for me, but it's been even more exciting this year as we bring you these earnings previews. So last quarter, we covered a few of the most um, important companies, let's say, uh, which are related to the macro. And this quarter, we're, we intend to do the same. Absolutely. And without further ado, let's dive right in. We'll talk a little bit more about what we're going to cover. First, we're going to look at the S&P 500 NASDAQ 100 earnings scorecard. Then we'll look at a preview for what's to come in the week ahead and particularly what we have our eyes on. Great. So we don't have a lot of... <laughs> Uh, reports as yet. On the S&P, we only have about 30 companies that have reported, and some of them are pretty small, but the major ones actually kicked off on Thursday and Friday, as you all know. And so far, we have about 6% of the companies that have reported. Now, earnings have come out pretty good, let's say, with growth reported at 9.9%, so almost 10% increase um, year on year in earnings growth. We've seen positive surprises of 80%. But as you can see, the blended earnings growth is still at negative 7.5%. So just to explain what how they calculate, this is from Faxet. And how they calculate the blended earnings growth is they take the actual reported growth and they add in the expected growth. So we have a mix of estimates and actual reporting. So that's why we have both these up here. So you can actually see what the estimate, how the estimates are changing, but as well how actual growth is increasing or decreasing. Now on the NASDAQ, we have about eight companies only that have reported, so 8% obviously. And uh, in fact, the blended earnings growth for the NASDAQ was to be a positive 7.2%. So people were very hopeful, or still are, let's say, hopeful of positive earnings coming out of the NASDAQ companies. Unfortunately, the reported growth thus far from these eight companies has been a negative 40%. Um, so I did, yes, that's that's quite a lot. And and the positive surprise is only about 50%, so much worse than the S&P, which is not severely surprising given that the S&P actually ranks companies by the best companies um, there are, right? Um, and the NASDAQ obviously has more tech companies. Now, the thing about tech companies, as we all know, they're very hit or miss. Those that are great can be high flyers, and those that are not can actually pull earnings down quite a bit. Now, next week, we have a really busy week ahead of us. Obviously, we have the banks, um, we have some transports, we have uh, a few of the industrials as well, and not to mention um, some of the metals and mining companies as well. Yeah, it's going to be a really busy week. Let's kick it right off, starting off with Taiwan Semi and Netflix. Taiwan Semi is an interesting case because the semiconductor industry in the U.S., in Japan, is priced to perfection. A lot of these companies have enjoyed a robust rally of multiple expansion. And in many cases, without the earnings expansion, you know, really just this rally is driven more by hope and hype, particularly as it pertains to AI, than underlying improvement in the semiconductor industry. Taiwan is the world's largest exporter of semiconductors. They actually do a lot of business with China and Hong Kong. That's where about 50% of their exports go. But they still do a fair amount of exports to the U.S. and to other regions around the world, Europe, South America, etc. And what we're seeing is outside of the U.S., where growth is continuing, in the rest of the world, there's actually a very large overhang. In inventory, uh, com companies are not replenishing as sales fall for smartphones, for computers, and for other electronics. And also, chips have gone into everything. So at this point, when we see consumption slowing down, a lot of that growth is also slowing as well. And we're not seeing the offset by AI chips that one would hope for to help to 
ameliorate this lack of demand. So what we've seen with Taiwan Semiconductor so far is slowing growth, slowing revenue, and trends that are set to continue in those areas based on the estimates that we see. Right now, Taiwan Semiconductor is expecting a buck 07 of adjusted EPS and 15.4 billion in revenue, falling from a buck 30 and 16.6 billion in the prior quarter, and also falling from a buck 53 and 17.8 billion last year this quarter. Those aren't great signs for a company that's trading at a PE of over 14. It would suggest that it's maybe modestly overpriced. We're also seeing some degree of compression in free cash flow. But what really concerns me is if you look at this chart here, Taiwan's chip exports, and who's the largest exporter in Taiwan? I'll give you one guess. It is Taiwan Semi. They're falling, and they're at the lowest year-over-year -year levels. This is the steepest fall we've seen in 14 years, and it mirrors some of the type of fall that we saw during the great financial crisis. And people out there might ask, well, why didn't we really see this during COVID? And it's kind of because COVID was a blip, and then a bunch of stimulus hit the system and started to pull demand forward. And so there wasn't enough time for that to really resonate then as it is now. And all that stimulus, it pulled forward years worth of demand into the present time. And that's all over. It's behind us. So the, the base effects from last year, all that growth being priced in, pulling forward years of demand makes for very tough comps for semiconductor companies and for Taiwanese exports, which is one of the reasons that they're falling. But underneath the surface, there is lackluster growth in key segments. So I think the, the issue here with Taiwan Semi is, A, their core business model is slowing materially. B, AI, even though it's promising and it's showing growth in certain key segments, it's not enough to offset that slowing growth from traditional use cases. And then we also, I feel, that we're not really pricing in the potential geopolitical tensions between Taiwan and China. Now, granted, China's the biggest customer of Taiwan's exports. That's, that's all well and good, but that inter interdependency could be resolved through other ways, which may include, if, Ty if China's very serious about this one-state solution, simply taking Taiwan and their manufacturing facilities and making it a part of the People's Republic of China. That is the risk. It is something that grows by the day, and I don't unfortunately think this is priced into Taiwan Semi or a number of other semiconductor stocks. So just full stop, semis are a little expensive here. Maybe not as much Taiwan Semi as companies like AMD that are trading at a PE of 500, or NVIDIA that's trading at a PE of over 200. Those are arguably much more expensive, but still... There's a lot of excitement in the space, and we just don't see the fundamentals. Now, granted, if NVIDIA delivers 11 plus billion of revenue this quarter and that growth is real and it continues on that trajectory, that's a modern miracle. But we have to see whether that replenishment cycle is durable. If it's a one off thing this quarter and it doesn't continue, then that's not going to look as good moving forward. Netflix is another interesting story. Uh, this is one that I'm really watching closely. And the reason is that this is a company that struggled a bit. Their founder, Reed Hastings, left. They were co-founder. But he was a really big part of the vision of bringing this company into existence and then transitioning in, and as their name suggested from the very beginning, to a internet-based streaming service. And that streaming service, things are not going as well as maybe they had hoped. The COVID boom, if you want to call it that, when everyone was locked up at home watching TV, saturating themselves in content and social media and e-commerce, everything you could do to kind of get your mind off the fact that you're stuck at home. Netflix boomed in that era. Now we're kind of in the hangover period. Growth in the U.S., which is Netflix's largest segment and accounts for the vast majority of their revenue, is actually slowing quite a bit. And that's something that I think is, it, the U.S. segment is 41.1% of total revenue. And last quarter, year over year, that revenue growth was up 0.9%. So probably not what you want to see for a company that is trading at a very high premium. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But we are seeing, to offset this, to, to, just by a modicum of encouraging growth, we are seeing encouraging growth in India up 15% year over year last quarter, Canada, 9.6%, Brazil, 9.5%, and the United Kingdom up 4.9%. But not all international markets are faring well. Japan fell down 9.3% year over year. France is down as well at 1.8% year over year. 
And the, the two regions combined account for 5.9%. The others, India, Canada, Brazil, and UK, account for 12.3%. So even when we add those both together, it's still not even basically half the size of what the US brings to Netflix. So, the, you know, Netflix has tried to expand. They're creating more international content. They're also trying to get into a different area, gaming. And that endeavor is... Mm, Mixed results, shall we say. One of their releases this year is among the best-rated games of 2023. Now, that deserves to be recognized. That's impressive. Accolades were their due. But a lot of the other games are mm, not so great. And so what Netflix is hoping to do is take their really engaged user base, right? The 18 to 30s, that's about 72% of the people that said they've used Netflix over the last year. And they want to get them in on the mobile app, and they want them playing games as another way to improve subscriber retention, but also so that they can go ahead and um, try to improve the data collection that they have. Being able to sell more ads, know more about their subscribers, it creates other potential revenue pipelines, and perhaps that gaming IP, that software, could be licensed out elsewhere eventually. Now, what I'm concerned about with Netflix is the company's trading at a PE of 37.10, and it's not growing, and it's expecting to see flat earnings in revenue quarter over quarter, with Q1-adjusted EPS coming in at $2.88 versus Q2. Uh, they're expecting $2.85 for this quarter, and revenue came in at $8.16 in the first quarter. This quarter, it's expected to come in at $8.27 billion. So it kind of concerns me a little bit that earnings are falling while revenue is expected to grow. Because that's telling me there's some margin compression. Year over year, we see the same trend. And that has to do with Netflix selling cheaper plans and also cutting prices for international customers to try to encourage growth. So at the end of the day, the company does seem to be struggling a little bit. Although their stock is priced to perfection, there's a lot of optimism about their future, they're still trying to find how to rekindle the engine of growth, and they're priced as if that growth is a near certainty. So that's one that I would keep an eye on for potentially, you know, if they're able to see the kind of subscriber growth that they're projecting out, that would be really encouraging. They are projecting out really strong subscriber growth, but if that doesn't manifest, I think this thing has some unpriced risk in it. Awesome. All very, very interesting uh, companies. Um, so I'm going to try and cover Tesla. Now, I'm sure uh, there are people out there who are better at covering Tesla than I am. I'm no Tesla expert, but I, of course, do keep a track of what's going on with the company and how they're faring and the numbers, of course. So let's start off with what they reported during the quarter. Uh, we ended last week with some good news from Tesla. The Cybertruck is finally out. So they've actually delivered the, I'm not sure if they delivered, but at least they produced the first Cybertruck, which is really good news for them. Uh, we also got Q2 deliveries and they beat consensus, consensus estimates. Um, so deliveries have improved. However, there is still some concern with inventories not moving as fast as uh, one would think. Now, their total production obviously has increased massively from a year ago. They're producing about 480,000 cars versus 258, 59,000, I want to say, last year. So that's a massive increase. And it's not surprising. Tesla has picked up a lot of steam over the last one year. It has become pretty popular. And EVs in general are becoming popular. Now, the one thing that... It, was very confusing, not just this quarter, but the quarter before that as well, was uh, their pricing, right? So one time they're increasing prices, then they're decreasing prices, then they're increasing prices. So it's like a little bit like a merry-go-round, and I'm not really sure <laughs> where we're at right now. Um, I'm not sure if that's by design or they're just trying to go along with it uh, and, and, you know, change prices as and when they view the market to be softer. Um, but the situation right now is such that they have overall decreased pricing with certain models and therefore that's actually putting pressure on their margins. And we saw that um, last quarter as well. So basically, although they delivered on their FSD growth uh, numbers, 
um, their margins, so uh, revenues did come down a little bit, but overall margins declined quite a bit. So, and everybody has their eye, eyes on the margin, obviously. But then if you look at Tesla in general, th their margins <laughs> were not like a car company anyway, right? So they had huge margins as it is. So I guess they do have some room to give up some of that margin, but in general, as an analyst, as an investor, none of us really want to see margin compression for any company. We would always like to see margins grow. And their margins came down, all their margins. So it's not just gross margin. So gross margin, operating margin, EBITDA margin, and net margin all came down, not just quarter on quarter, but also year on year. So um, quite much softer than we would want it to be. So that's something that we need to look out for. We want to see margins at least stabilize we don't want to see further declines but we want to see stabilization of their margins now the other few positive things that they talked about or, or that happened during the quarter was this thing with the chargers where now other um, car companies will be using tesla chargers as well i think this is a big positive for the company actually so that's a big win for them um, finally, they also have been discussing a new plant in India with a cap capacity of producing 500,000 vehicles. Still in very early stages, we don't know what's happening there, how much it will cost and all of that. But that's something I want to keep an eye on, um, their uh, CapEx spend, because they have been spending a lot of CapEx over the last few quarters. They increased their CapEx guidance for 2023 from six to eight billion to seven to nine billion so not by much about a billion here and there uh, but that's still a lot of money as well right and uh, so for q1 they've already spent about two billion in capex um, the reason i say that i want to keep an eye on this is because tesla has started to produce like really good solid free cash flow and one thing about free cash flow is that you take out your capex from it right so the more they increase their capex, the less their free cash flow is, and that's so. These are two numbers that we want to keep an eye on. We want to keep an eye on margins, and we want to keep an eye on free cash flows. For a company that's become free cash flow positive, we certainly don't want to see it go down. And just to give you an idea of what happened, so in Q4 we had free cash flow of 1.4 billion. In Q3 we had free cash flow of 3.3 billion, and Last quarter, we had free cash flow of only 441 million. So that's a number that I would like to see them increase, and I'd like to see margins stable. Next up, we have uh, a pair trade idea that we had talked about, and this is JB Hunt versus CSX. So our pair trade idea that we had put out was long rails and short transports. And the thesis behind this was basically during the pandemic, when we had all these supply chain issues, the fastest way to get um, goods from one point to another was obviously trucks, right? So the demand for trucking had gone up massively. We had a lot of congestion in uh, the supply chain and moving things on trains, it just wasn't cutting it, right? It was too long and um, it took too long to get things from one place to the other. And since you were using trucks anyway for that last mile delivery, most people just opted to use trucks all the way. So there was a lot of demand for trucking. Now, that's changed. We've seen all the numbers. We've seen all the data that shows us that supply chain issues are no longer a problem. And so our thesis was based on the fact that all that extra demand, a lot of that has gone away. Yes, we understand that. But even though uh, demand has come down, there is still some residual demand. And that will move from truckers to rail carriers because rail carriers are cheaper um they can have they can move more bulk uh in one go and obviously in terms of energy costs things are much better there now we'd also talked about a freight recession and guess what jb hunt mentioned that uh last time around so when the ceo came on we we discussed this before Q1 earnings in our preview, we had talked about a freight recession going on where freight rates were being taken down at the spot level. So any rates that were negotiated immediately were already lower. And then we would be seeing 
contracted rates that were coming up for renewal would also be coming down. So JB Hunt CEO came on and he pointed out exactly the same thing. He talked about a freight recession. He talked about being cautious on the outlook for the year. And they posted a double miss uh, with significantly lower volumes. So we were right on the money about all these things. Um, also talked about softness and demand for big bulky products, so appliances, furniture, exercise equipment. And they talked about, you know, this cycle uh, being very aggressive and leading to a lot of retail destocking. So, and we know this, right? So we know that retail has been trying to get rid of some of the goods and um, give out discounts and not restock. So they were basically going through a destock, right? Um, so that was that was everything that we talked about, and it came in line with that. Now, in terms of JB Hunt's price, stock price, they did take a hit, but it would seem somewhere around mid-June, they've got a new lease on life, and the stock price has been increasing again. And so our pair trade was working quite well until mid-June, but what it would seem uh, is that, you know, JB Hunt is... Uh, let's say recovering, their, their stock price is at least recovering. I don't know if the company is recovering. We'll know about that uh, this week. Now, on the other hand, the reason for liking CSX was that they had a new CEO come on board in September. He made a lot of changes. And one of the main things that he changed was not just like putting CSX on precision tri timing, but also he was paying attention to employee relations, which was a big issue in the rail sector, if you remember. We were having issues with unions and all of that. So he basically said that, okay, I'm going to focus on employee relations and I'm going to focus on customer service. And uh, not because of these things, but they actually had a fantastic quarter in quarter one. They had a double beat. Um, and it was interestingly uh, led by an increase in coal exports. Coal exports or their coal volumes were up 19% year on year. So they're big in moving coal. And look, I I honestly don't have anything very negative to say about CSX. I do like the company. I do like how they're being run. And I think we should um, watch this closely. I think it's great to watch the transports because it tells you so much about how the economy is actually performing. And they're probably one of the best guides uh, to you know, like macro and how much how much is being sold, goods, um, retail, and all of that. So we'll be watching that closely as well. Great coverage. Let's also move right forward to some sectors and focus that I know you'd like to talk about for our audience. Absolutely. So the three sectors, to, to kick it off, the three sectors are investment banks, regional banks, and consumer finance. So investment banks, we have the big two reporting, Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs. Now, you know, most estimates say that trading revenue has dropped by about 17% year on year for investment banks. And JP Morgan actually saw an 8% decrease during the quarter. And so that should be some guide for Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, both of whom are, you know, more investment banks. They don't have Goldman Sachs and neither of them have any, sorry, consumer banking, not commercial banking. Of course, they have commercial banking. Um, so commercial banking has taken a little bit of a hit. So <clears throat> trading revenues are down, m and revenues are down, issuances are down. We know IPO issuances are down. Some of it is coming back, but not a lot. So I don't expect... Mm, great results from the investment banks this time around. Um, I think things are, you know, we're in for some trouble. We've heard about Goldman Sachs letting go of some of the people and some of their departments. And a lot of those uh, costs, those are going to translate into costs as they give end of service benefits and stuff like that to let go of these people. So we'll be watching them. But for now, uh, I think Morgan Stanley might do slightly better than Goldman Sachs. But for now, um, there's nothing to be done here. Now, in terms of the regional banks, obviously, expectations are horrible for the regional banks. So we actually might see some positive surprises. 
Um, but rest assured, this does not mean that everything is okay, right? So depending on which regional banks we're looking at, so there are different sizes, different exposures. As we saw, the problems that plagued Silicon Valley Bank were not the same problems that actually took First Republic down. They were very, very different. Yeah, both regional banks, but two very different sets of problems. So each of these banks have their nuances. But in general, what we would be looking for is we'll be watching the lending levels. We'll be watching the deposit levels. And I think, you know, lending has slowed, but not as much as we expected because of the Fed's backstop, right? So the banks have to make money. They have to lend. And I don't think that they have actually pulled back on lending as much as expected. So we will see lending volume drop but maybe not as much as we had thought. Now, the other very, very important thing we'd be looking at is obviously the provisions they're taking and any losses that they have already booked. Now, in terms of provisions, Gold, uh, sorry, JP Morgan actually came out okay. They increased their provisions, of course, but they were kind of okay. They didn't go overboard. They didn't have to go overboard. But then you have to understand, banks like JP Morgan have very high lending standards. So, you know, their credit quality is much better than most of these regional banks who have to support a lot of the small businesses out there, right? Because what else will they do? They have who else will they bank with? So um we're likely to see a lot more provisioning, higher losses with the regional banks. Now the other thing we'll be looking at is changes to capital requirements. You know, we've heard about um, increases coming to capital requirements. We don't know uh, the levels yet. We don't know who it will affect. But what we can tell you in general is that if the capital base has to increase, we will obviously see lower returns on capital. Banks will have to become very choosy about the projects that they finance because um, you need more capital to finance riskier projects. Uh, so banks will be very, very, you know, let's say specific in their lending. Um, they'll probably cut back on dividends. They'll probably cut back on buybacks. Um, and so in general, lending activity will fall if, you know, the capital base is increased. So let's keep an eye out for some what some of the bigger banks are talking about in terms of the capital base increasing. And for now, I would still not be very gung-ho about, you know, investing in regional banks just yet. Um, finally, we also have consumer finance. Now, where consumer finance is concerned, so we have Synchrony, Discover, Amex, Capital One, and Ally, all of them reporting. There's like a whole host of consumer finance reporting next week. Uh, we'll be looking at delinquency rates and net charge-offs. Um, so the only thing that I want to talk about here and the other major sector that we have reporting uh, this week is consumer finance. So we have Synchrony, Discover, Amex, Capital One and Ally reporting. Now, in terms of these companies, the two things that we are obviously watching are delinquency rates and net charge off rates. And then without speaking too much about any of this, I just want to show you this chart where we track delinquency rates and net charge off rates. So we've been tracking this on a monthly basis and I've color coded it for you. So it's very easy for you to tell what's going on here. So if you look at the top, the banks are okay. They're kind of okay. Yes, things are getting a little stretched, but they're still kind of okay. But if you look at these consumer finance companies, so you look at Capital One, Synchrony and Discover, we're turning red. We've been turning red from the beginning of the year and we're turning redder, right? So things are not going great here. And then finally, you have Amex. Now, Amex, again, they have, I think, tighter lending standards, you know, and so therefore they're kind of doing okay as well. So Amex, I would count as one of the bigger banks, even though they're heavily into credit card, but I think they have far different standards than the other three. So this is obviously something to take note of. Now, I know you can say that it's still at only 4% or 5% and it's not reached a level to be worried about. But in my opinion, we're not trending the right way. 
right? What I would really like to see is this red stay amber, not become redder as we go along. So things are not great. And I, I, this is something that we do need to, you know, be concerned about because these three companies, they lend to everyone, right? So these are the normal people. These are not the Amex high flyers, black cards and those kind of things. These are not the platinum people. These are not the people banking with JP Morgan and Citi and, you know, all those fancy cards. These are the regular people, people who are buying stuff on credit card because they have no other choice. Um, and they're delaying payments and they can't do anything if they can't pay it back. And this is in a situation where we have unemployment at record lows. What starts to happen when unemployment gradually starts to increase? And we know that's going to happen. I, I know we can keep saying that unemployment will remain tight, but we are tracking the data and we know that there are pockets in, of the economy where unemployment is not great. Um, people are being let go. And this is reflective of all of that. So let's keep an eye on this data. We'll be tracking this every month. We do track this every month uh, at Macrovisor and we'll continue to track it um, going forward. Yeah, it's it's really quite concerning what we're seeing. We've in good times, you know, presumably are seeing consumers that 60% are living paycheck to paycheck, 40% are starting to be late on their bills. When we look at uh, people that are 18 to 28, they have the highest delinquency rates on their credit cards going back to 2010, which was just right after the peak of the great financial crisis. And this is, like you said, this is in relatively good times, relatively low unemployment. So we'll keep a pace of this. And one of the areas that we want to talk about when we monitor this will be ISM services because that's been where the resilience is. We've seen a lot of weakness in manufacturing. And so we believe that as we monitor services, as time goes on, contraction there will lead to higher levels of jobless claims, will lead to higher levels of unemployment, will eventually lead to this stress increasing. So we've got our eyes on it, as Aisha said, and, and we've got a very capable set of eyes on it, someone who spent 19 years in corporate banking, helping us to navigate this tumultuous period. Sectors in focus as we continue here, we're looking at tech defense and medical technology. First and foremost, we're looking at ASML, the company which makes the equipment that helps semiconductor companies manufacture more sophisticated circuitry is facing ramifications from the geopolitical strife with China. Whereas the Dutch government is now saying, you know what, we don't want you exporting all that really advanced stuff to China. We're going to have to have you curb that. ASML is saying we can't possibly hope to diversify the global supply chain away from China. That We're too far in. There's no way to get out of this sort of inextricably. The collective fates of semiconductor technology around the world is bound together, according to their view. So that really tells us that it's, if the Dutch government is restricting the availability of this technology to China, that is going to hurt one of their biggest clients, right? ASML has a lot of exposure to China, as does much of the semiconductor industry. In fact, uh, some were shocked to learn just how much exposure Qualcomm has. I believe it's over 50% of their revenue is generated in China. Broadcom is another one where those levels are quite high as well. So just things to consider here as we navigate through all of this. We talked a little bit about the struggles Taiwan Semi is facing, right? And Taiwan Semi helps to fabricate semiconductors, and they have a number of really big name clients like NVIDIA, AMD, MediaTek. On the other side of it, you can kind of consider ASML up above that in the sense that they're selling the equipment that helps companies like Taiwan Semi produce these goods. So if you're Taiwan Semi right now or another semi company and you're seeing inventories rise, you're seeing demand fall, what are you not doing? You're probably not ordering a lot of new equipment. So we are seeing expectations for ASM sales, ASML sales to kind of plateau, flatten out a bit here. Um, the estimate for quarter two earnings is $5.04 adjusted EPS and this is from a company that was actually doing uh, you know, quite a bit better last year overall. Um, so I, I just think that it's a little bit concerning. Their, their quarter, they're also slipping from their quarter one. Really, I'm looking at quarter over quarter revenue compression and earnings compression being the big concern here. In the first quarter, they earned $5.44 adjusted EPS. 
And in the second quarter, they're projected to earn $5.04. The revenue in the first quarter was seven. dollars Point three nine billion versus what's projected at seven point three billion in the second quarter. Now I misspoke, but year over year they are actually up on their adjusted earnings. So three dollars and sixty two cents last year this time with revenue of five point five four billion. And so what does that tell us? It tells us that this may be uh, another story, but a little bit different, where there's actually some degree of margin expansion here, which is good. But at the same time, they might have one of their largest customers kind of, let's just say, bottlenecked. I wouldn't say that it's the end of the relationship between ASML and China, but it's going to restrict a lot of the more advanced technology that China really wants to get their hands on as we go throughout this AI arms race, which requires ever more sophisticated semiconductor fabrication technology. The other thing that I would say, just as we wrap up the thoughts on ASML here, is that... One of the problems they have is the value of their new orders is actually falling as we look forward. And this is another situation that ties into the sort of stalled hardware refresh cycle that manufacturers are having to deal with. So the outlook for the remainder of 2023, based on current estimates, is pretty soft. Basically, flat revenue and earnings as we go out the year. Shifting over to the defense sector, we know that there is increasing geopolitical tension. We just talked about it a little bit with the EU and China, but China, Russia, the situation with Russia and Ukraine, Taiwan and China, some of the escalating tensions in the Asia, Asia Pacific, not to mention what's going on with North Korea and Iran continuing to be, I would say, adversarial with the postures between the U.S. and all of these nations being increasingly hostile over time, it suggests that the need for defense is likely to grow. The military industrial complex in America is nearly a $1 trillion a year industry with the defense budget in next year set to hit $910 billion dollars which is incredible. The growth that we're seeing in defense spending in and of itself is, is just absolutely staggering. And that's one of the reasons that Lockheed Martin could be a beneficiary of what's happening there. And remember, going back to 2015, the defense budget was $633 billion. This year, it's $857 billion. So we're trending in the right direction for aerospace and defense, if you want to look at it that way. Now, revenue for Lockheed Martin... Um, is expected to be relatively flat quarter over quarter and year over year. The same is true with their earnings. Aeronautics, as one of their key segments, is seen as being rather flat, but there is growth in missiles and fire control, as well as rotary and mission systems. And part of this is likely related to the sort of replenishment of weapons and ammo that has to happen after we basically send our entire arsenal to Ukraine. Backlogs at Lockheed Martin continue to grow, up to 145 billion dollars in the first quarter, up from 139.7 billion in the third quarter of 2022. They tend to update that every half year. So they got plenty of future business to come. So I would say with ongoing geopolitical tensions rising, Lockheed Martin is a defensive stock in the defensive space. They're a preferred government contractor, and they have relationships with the government that go out years, if not over a decade, in terms of that backlog. So relatively safe, a little bit richly valued where it is right now, though, given the lack of earnings growth. So I wouldn't want to get long this particular company, but I do like looking at general dynamics in the defense space. So there are other opportunities in that sector. When we go over to medical technology, intuitive surgical is seeing some slowing procedure growth. Now, there's something that concerns me a little bit about this, because as I just mentioned in the past, one of the reasons we're bullish on medical technology is there's this huge backlog of procedures. And yet intuitive is not seeing that. That's a little bit concerning in that kind of environment where a lot of the other competitors are, obviously there's some differentiation, but they're benefiting. Intuitive isn't. And this is a company that has expecting well, not very impressive growth, given that they're trading at a PE of 69.94 and their earnings per share are only now getting back to levels that they were in 2021. And we're seeing some level of margin compression here because revenue continues to grow, outpacing earnings growth. So I would say, looking at their key segments, growth is more resilient in instruments, which is their key largest revenue generator, but systems and services where there may be better margin is slowing considerably. 
So with a large backlog of procedures in the pipeline and this company not benefiting, I'm a little bit concerned. I'm very interested to see what they report in terms of their earnings. But I would say that caution is warranted because other places in medical technology look much more promising. Absolutely. So we do like uh, Medtronic in that space because, you know, um, they have the devices that are sort of getting a tailwind from the improvement in procedures, right? So we, we, we're we seeing or we heard from UNH as well, who said ortho and cardiac procedures are improving. And uh, one of the biggest reasons that we heard from Medtronic themselves is because the labor situation has improved. So just to give you a brief about that, um, during all this period when there wasn't enough labor, you know, hiring in the medical sector because of COVID, because of fears of COVID and all of that, people couldn't go in to get surgeries, not because the doctors were not available, not necessarily because the doctors were not available, but because, you know, the technicians were not available to do the scans, um, the scrub nurses were not available. So a lot of the support staff actually uh, were not available for these procedures, which is why there was this pent up demand in procedures and now we're seeing that ease. Now in terms of intuitive surgical, uh, they have a big exposure to China and that is probably pulling them down a bit. So their biggest thing is this robotic surgical system, right? This uh, the, the Da Vinci system. Uh, and uh, a lot of those sales um, are into China as well. And we know that China's demand hasn't picked up as such. We might see some improvement in that, but, you know, Mayhem is right. It's not nearly as, you know, great as we're seeing in other companies in the sector. Now, um, to move on to the final few sectors, we look at the largest home builder reporting as well, DR Horton. Now, DR Horton's um, symbol is DHI. Okay, so just to make that clear, um, because it has nothing to do with DR Horton, so it sounds weird. Um, so yes, DR Horton is the largest home builder in the US. Uh, now we've discussed the shortage in the housing market about two weeks ago as one of our research themes. And we're seeing evidence um, of that in the macro data as well. So we saw residential construction picking up the most in overall construction data. So you can see a chart there. It's not very clear, but the numbers are there. Residential construction is picking up. We saw Lennar report new orders and uh, actually all the home builders uh, reporting new orders picking up. Um, we saw the labor report that showed construction was one of the areas that led the way in new hires. So that's yet another positive, something we haven't seen in previous uh, months. So we think the outperformance will continue with DR Horton, but just something to be mindful of over here, something to watch out for. DR Horton's margins have been decreasing. And one of the reasons for that is because They've been giving incentives for home purchases, and that's been sort of, you know, compressing their margins a little bit. So we'll be looking out for margins. And, um, you know, because everybody has this expectation of outperformance, just be careful if you're thinking about being earnings. I mean, um, th they will or most likely will outperform, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the stock will uh, you know, behave as such, as in we might not see the stock soar as we have in previous quarters. Uh, which brings me to the airlines. So we saw Delta report and they delivered a fantastic beat on their increased guidance. So during their investor day, they increased their guidance and they've actually beat all of that. And they saw significant pickup in domestic and international traffic. However, the stock did sell off. And I think one of the reasons for that, again, was because, you know, the expectations were just too high. And yes, they beat, but, you know, it, it was sort of like a non-event, let's say. Now, 
with United and American, um, I think, you know, we expect the same. We're seeing these tailwinds from travel and leisure and they're boosting earnings. United just reached an agreement with their pilots to increase pay by 35 to 40% over 10 years. Now, this might be a cost, but it is a net positive for them because they have been struggling with, you know, pilots there. So this will increase their capacity. Now, June wasn't a great month for them. They had some cancellations, you know, this could hurt capacity, but at the same time, fuel prices were lower, so they might that might balance it out. Now, in terms of American Airlines, you know, they really need a breakout quarter here. Um, and they probably will deliver, but again, you know, expectations are high for these two companies after what Delta has done. And so even if they do end up beating, the stock may not react as much. And finally, we have mining. So we have Alcoa and FCX reporting. Now, we know commodity prices have come down and therefore mining revenues have also come down, right? So the, globally, everybody's expecting a recession or at least a softer economic growth overall. China's demand hasn't picked up either as the way, you know, we thought it would. So Alcoa has already borne the brunt of this quite a lot. You know, aluminum prices have they've been falling since the third quarter of last year. And Alcoa's reports have been horrible. Uh, their EPS is heavily negative now. Um, but we'll be watching for what they say about levels of demand. So this is why we watch the mining companies, because it's so... Um, they give us so much information in terms of how global growth is faring, right? Because these demand levels tell us so much, right? And then in terms of copper, copper prices have been volatile. They haven't, you know, sold off as much. So we did see some sell off and then they've come back. But so they've just been very, very volatile. Now, FCX has a budget of about $4, um, which means a 10% in, uh, sorry, a 10 cent increase um, in the price of copper uh, increases or decreases their PNL by 315 million. So this is a good statistic to know. Um, they do expect volumes to increase this quarter. They expect uh, copper volumes to increase by 28%, gold volumes to increase by 85%. So they're very optimistic. Now, the thing with FCX is they're actually located in uh, fairly, uh, their, their mines are located in fairly benign regions, so no conflicts and stuff like that. So they've been doing okay. However, last last to last quarter, they did report issues with you know labor uh, shortages and things like that. So we'll be watching for all of this again. Copper is super important. I think FCX gives us a great guide as to what's going on in that world. And as we wrap up here, let's just review some of the key takeaways from why we're watching what we're watching and what some of those impacts could be, what the signals are that we're receiving. As, as you like to say, Aisha, it's always a story in the numbers. Most definitely. So <clears throat> the, some of the things that we did cover were, you know, credit card delinquencies and net charge-offs, which defaults basically are on the rise and we should be watching this closely for how the consumer is doing uh, we'll be watching regional banks for you know how lending conditions are tightening provisions losses capital constraints uh, we think home builders will continue to outperform particularly because the shortage still remains and of course, we'll be watching transports um, for how the economy is moving within the U.S. And miners will tell us about the global demand and supply and global economic conditions. And of uh, course, finally, we have global chip demand. Yeah, that's going to be a key one to watch as well. And it's not looking so good. Exports from Taiwan, Korea, and various reads from leading semiconductor companies are telling us that inventories remain high and demand is falling at a rather alarming rate. Now, when we take into consideration why demand was so high last year, it ameliorates some level of concern, but it's still worrisome and it still does suggest that there's a lot of slack in the goods sector that's simply not being taken up and semiconductors ramped up production during a time where there was the largest pull forward of good demand, goods demand perhaps in human history, and now we're dealing with the hangover. So, we want to thank everyone for tuning in to this episode of the Macrovisor earnings preview. And we want to let you know out there that this free preview, gratis on us, 
is something that we're hoping to give you a little bit of a flavor for what we're doing and how we're doing it here. The next previews, as we move about through Q2 earnings season, they will be paid, but you can get a 40% discount if you sign up with Macrovisor before Saturday. So by this Friday, the 21st, all you have to do is hit the subscribe button and you're going to save 40%. So we really appreciate you tuning in. We hope to see you soon.